My topic for today is controversies to consensus in the management of hypertension. Now, what are the controversies that surround hypertension? The first, when should we initiate treatment with antihypertensive therapy? What is that blood pressure which if you find in your clinic or in your hospital setting, after that you have to start antihypertensive therapy? What is that blood pressure? The second controversy, what should we start as the first drug for this patient? Should it be an ACE inhibitor? Should it be a calcium channel blocker? Should it be a diuretic? Should it be an alpha blocker? What is it that we need to give? The third controversy, what is the goal blood pressure that you require to reach for that particular patient that you are dealing? When are you going to stop adding antihypertensive therapy? Or when are you going to stop up titrating the medication dosage? And lastly, what is the ideal time of administration of an antihypertensive drug? Is it to be given in the morning or is it to be given in the evening? Well, first on a lighter note, we'll say, we had just been talking about Lenik inventing the stethoscope. So let's find out how the Spigmo manometer, the BP instrument, was invented. It dates back to way back in 1733 when Reverend Stephen Hales first measured the blood pressure. He measured the height of a column of blood after cannulating the carotid artery in a horse with a brass pipe. He was very impressed with that. The brass pipe was attached to a 12-inch glass tube. And this tube was connected to the pipe via the trachea of a goose. A second try was done about 100 years later when a mercury manometer was connected to the artery. Now, both of these methods were invasive methods. So it was very uncomfortable for the patient and couldn't be done routinely. Subsequently, in 1890, River Rossi invented the Spigmo manometer as we know it today. So, Kaplan has said that the measurement of the blood pressure is a clinical procedure of greatest importance and it is often performed in the sloppiest of manners. So what do the Indian guidelines say about the measurement of blood pressure? Well, they say that we need to take an average of at least three readings, each at intervals of at least three minutes, and patients should be asked to refrain from drinking tea, coffee, or smoking, or doing exercise at least 30 minutes before the measurement of the blood pressure. We have to allow the patient to sit for at least five minutes in a quiet room before we begin the blood pressure measurement. Measurement should be done in the sitting or in the supine posture. Patient's arm should be fully bared, supported at the level of the heart, and it should be measured in both arms, and the higher of the two readings has to be taken. So all of these key techniques need to be followed for an accurate measurement of the blood pressure of an individual. Because if we don't follow any of these, there are going to be variations. If the patient doesn't rest, if the patient comes in after some exercise, the pressure is going to be higher. If the cuff size is too small, it's going to be higher. So all these things need to be followed, which very commonly in our practice we are unable to do. So what is the Indian scenario of hypertension? Well, the prevalence in India is almost to the tune of 30%. So 30% of the population does suffer from hypertension, and the prevalence is higher in the urban areas. In our cities, it is much higher than in the rural areas. And this trend has been seen over the last 50 years, that there was a steeper increase in the prevalence of hypertension in the urban areas rather than in the rural areas. So, if we look at a prevalence of hypertension about 30%, and the number of patients who are aware that they have hypertension out of all these patients is only to the tune of about 40%. And out of them, there are only about 37% of the hypertensives who are being treated. So despite all the efforts which we do, the level of awareness about blood pressure is still very low in India. And that is evident with the lower proportion of patients who achieve an optimal control of the blood pressure. So there have been various guidelines which have been postulated for the management of hypertension. And all the guidelines have certain similarities and certain differences. For example, if you look at the JNCA, the European Society of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the American Society of Hypertension, most of them have identified a cutoff level of greater than 140 by 90 if the patient is less than 60 years of age, and a pressure of 
greater than 150 by 90 if the patient is greater than 60 years of age if you want to start treatment. Again, beta blockers have now been eliminated from most of the guidelines except for the European Society of Hypertension guidelines and the Indian guidelines. <clears throat> and of course, if you are planning to start initiation of therapy for patients with a blood pressure greater than 160 by 100 on their first visit, then you would probably start with two medications. So what do the Indian hypertension guidelines say? Because all of us ethnically, we are Indians. So we need to look at what the Indian hypertension guidelines say. And they say that the patient is younger than 55 years, you would start with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. If the patient is older than 55 years, you would think of starting with a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic. In step two, if it is not controlled with these medications, you would think of adding A with either C or D. In step three, if even with two drugs it's not controlled, we would add all the three together. And in step four patients, those with resistant hypertension requiring multiple drug therapy, we would probably add an alpha blocker or spironolactone or some other diuretic. Beta blockers, again, in Indian guidelines are still very much in vogue for patients who have compelling indications like they are patients with prior, uh, prior myocardial infarction or they have CAD in some other form or they have some arrhythmic events or they have congestive heart failure, beta blockers are still used in our Indian guidelines. Chlorthalidone is now available and is shown to be better than hydrochlorothiazide. Usage is now being preferred over the older hydrochlorothiazide. So why were beta blockers uh, removed from most of the guidelines? Well, it was done because of the LIFE trial and the ASCOT study. In both of these beta blockers, etinolol actually was compared with losartan and ARB, and on the other hand, it was compared with amlodipine, and they found that it didn't really do very well. The all-cause mortality didn't fare well. So as a result of these trials, beta blockers became out of vogue. However, there have been newer beta blockers on the block. For example, nevibolol is a vasodilating beta blocker and gives very good results in hypertension. So there have been a lot of recent publications with these newer vasodilating beta blockers, for example, nevibolol, and they are third generation agents and it has been recommended that it should be added to the treatment guidelines. So maybe in the next guidelines, we might see nevibolol having a place. Now what was new? Well, what is new in this year is that we had the publication of the SPRINT trial and the HOPE 3 trial, and both of these created a furor in the management of hypertension. So the SPRINT trial, the systolic blood pressure intervention trial, it came up with the hypothesis that after JNC8, everybody was very clear that, okay, we have to start antihypertensive medication at 140 by 90, 150 by 90. The SPRINT trial was a very large trial having more than 12,000 patients, and they said, we are going to have an aggressive treatment arm, less than 120 millimeter mercury pressure, and we are going to have a standard treatment arm that is less than 140. And we'll compare the, what is the outcome, the cardiovascular composite outcomes, time to first occurrence of a heart attack, a stroke, congestive heart failure, admission for heart failure. So we are going to evaluate that in the two groups, a standard therapy and an aggressive blood pressure lowering therapy. And what did they find? They found that the intensive treatment arm had a 25% lower risk of primary outcome. They looked at the adverse events and they found that there wasn't a lot of difference between the adverse events. It wasn't significant. So they concluded that treatment effect was similar in all the pre-specified subgroups. And they found that overall, the benefit of an intensive blood pressure lowering, that is to less than 120, exceeded the potential for harm for these patients. So what were the implications in our practice? Suddenly there was a big furor in the medical community that okay, the 140 target was wrong. We need to get it down to 120. But then Sprint played a very large amount of importance to the measurement of blood pressure. They did it exactly in the way that it was meant to be done. Half an hour of you know keeping the patient quiet, a five minute in an empty room, no doctor was present, no lab technical staff was present, an automatic machine which was calibrated. So the implication came that the blood pressure lowering measured in such ideal situations would actually be much lower. So if sprint is applied without attention to proper blood pressure measurement, substantial overtreatment will occur in our practice with a higher rate of adverse events 
might occur. So would the guidelines change for a stringent target of systolic BP less than 120? We don't really know. But what has happened, that if you look at the detail of the trial, they achieved a systolic BP of 121.5, which was more than 120. And this likely represents a very judicious balancing by the clinicians who were treating, who tried to approximate the target of 120 while avoiding the side effects of the drugs. Also, there were certain clues from Sprint that the drug that they used, instead of chlorothalidone, instead of hydrochlorothiazide, they used chlorothalidone. They used amlodipine as the calcium channel blocker of choice, and beta blockers were less used in that trial. Then came the HOPE trial. The HOPE trial was also very interesting because it was a kind of a primary prevention trial. They had intermediate risk patients with normal or lower blood pressure, and they were put on antihypertensives. It also had another arm in which they gave rosuvastatin 10 mg, but we're talking about hypertension today. So they gave antihypertensive in the form of hydrochlorothiazin and candesartan to reduce the cardiovascular events. And the co-primary outcomes are very similar, death, non-fatal stroke, MI. And they found that if you looked at the cumulative in incidence, there wasn't a big difference. So HOPE found no significant difference in individual components of outcomes, total mortality or new onset diabetes. So there was no significant difference. They looked at the death, they looked at the co-primary outcomes and they found no significant difference. So HOPE 3 was a negative trial except for one subgroup of HOPE 3. Now this subgroup had a blood pressure greater than 143.5. And it was only in this group that they were able to demonstrate that if you give antihypertensive therapy, there is going to be a better outcome. Again, HOPE 3 also had a great amount of implication on the clinical practice of measurement of blood pressure. So the results of HOPE 3, they contradicted the finding of SPRINT trial. They contradicted the lower is better hypothesis. So again, there was a big furore in the medical community that SPRINT says lower is better and HOPE 3 says no, lower is not better. So they found that only the patients who had a systolic blood pressure greater than 140 would have some beneficial effect from this antihypertensive addition. Again, we'll talk about a couple of the special cases in hypertension, that is hypertension in diabetic patients and hypertension in chronic kidney disease patients. If you look at the JNC8, JNC8 has actually eliminated everything. They have fixed one target. Even if the patient is uh, chronic kidney disease, patient has diabetes, it didn't matter to them. But there was the publication of the ACCORD trial, which had about 4,500 diabetic patients with a creatinine less than 1.5. And in this, they targeted that if you target them to a pressure of 120 or you target them to a pressure of 140, what is the result? And they found that it did not reduce the rate of composite outcome of fatal and non-fatal major cardiovascular events. So there was no benefit in these diabetic patients of doing aggressive blood pressure reduction. However, there have been multiple other trials earlier done. And so the goal blood pressure from all the consensus, from all the guidelines came that you need to get a blood pressure of less than 140 by 90 for patients less than 60 and a pressure of less than 150 by 90 for patients greater than 60. And if your patient is a diabetic with proteinuria or he has chronic kidney disease with proteinuria, then a pressure of less than 130 by 80 is recommended. And this was endorsed by the KDGO guidelines for the nephrologists. We come to the last controversy, that is chronopharmacology. What is the best time to give an antihypertensive medication? Now, barring diuretics, which we always give in the morning, what about the others? Would you give a telmisartan at night or in the morning? Would you give an amlodipine at night or in the morning? Well. There have been some trials conducted on this, and especially the MAPEC trial said that there is a lower risk of cardiovascular events, that is death, MI, and stroke, with an evening dosing of the antihypertensive. This was again shown in the TIMES uh, trial in the early results. The, it is expected to near completion in 2019, but the early data show similar results. Again, the HYGIA trial, which is expected completion in 2020, is investing the, investigating the same pattern of administration of antihypertensive. The Cochrane review way back in 2011 
didn't show a clini clinically relevant outcome, but they showed that there was better blood pressure control with bedtime dosing of antihypertensives. So we come back to the original slide before we conclude, controversies to consensus. Now what is the consensus? When do we start therapy? When the BP is greater than 140 by 90. What do we start as the first drug? Less than 55 years, please start an ACE inhibitor or ARB. More than 55 years, start a calcium channel blocker or diuretic. If the patient has concomitant heart disease, please start with a beta blocker also. What is the goal that you need to achieve? Less than 60 years, you need to get to a goal of less than 140, 90. Patient is greater than 60 years, get to a goal of less than 150 by 90. Patient has chronic kidney disease with proteinuria. Blood pressure of 130 by 80 is your target. Patient is a renal transplant patient. A blood pressure of 130 by 80 is your target. So to conclude, hypertension, it remains a public health problem in India and of great importance. Methodology to measure the accurate blood pressure should be given due importance. Now, although the recent trials have provided useful information for lowering the blood pressure further, till now, the usual goals of blood pressure need to be followed. It can be lowered in certain special populations like CKD. Choice of drugs ultimately has to be individualized to that particular patient. Till more data emerge, we would require an evening dosing of antihypertensives. And it is high time that we Indians have our own cardiovascular outcome trials. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.